CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In the mythology of ancient Greece... Hypnos, the god of sleep, and Thanatos, the god of death, were twin brothers, and for good reason. When you turn out the light beside your bed and snuggle down under the sheets for a good night's rest, you finally slowly drift off into a form of unconsciousness. This blacking out, this easing into a soft and shapeless state of non-existence, gives you an inkling, a kind of preview of what it may mean to enter the doorway of sleep's shadowy brother, death. The brown-purple blood gathered in a swift bead trickling over my side. I could see it. Forrest flung the scalpel aside and began to shout. Ice! Ice! Quick, somebody let me have some ice! Lots of it! Even though my body still clung to me there on the operating table by the merest thread, I knew that Dr. Forrest, in spite of all his skill, had murdered me. <laughs> mystery drama, The Long, Long Sleep, was suggested by a short story of H.G. Wells and was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When destiny decides a man's time has run out, When a gaunt figure menacingly emerges from the half-darkness, his face cloaked under a huge black cowl, and his long, bony finger beckons you to join him, how can you be sure whether or not you are ready? By what signs do you recognize this to be the final eternal sleep, the sleep from which no one awakes? It's the night of December 31st, and Norman Hill and his wife, Lori, a couple in their middle 50s, are at home, alone. New Year's Eve, the end and the beginning. For the first time ever, Lori and I had decided to stay home together. Why? I wasn't really sure. But there was an unknown something that was bothering me. Only a couple of minutes to go, Lori. Well, another year will have gone by. Mm-hmm. You don't feel bad about our not going out? Norman, of course not. What we're doing makes the only sense. This is perfect. Yeah. Just the two of us alone. In an apartment that's begging to be painted. Well, I'll have the painters in any day now. I promise. Okay. Ooh, now let's get to that jar of caviar. Right, and real imported champagne. The best that money can buy. Now, when you get the promotion they've been promising you at the office. Yeah, and the very good chance of my book being picked up as a paperback. Oh, Norman, I'm a very lucky woman. Hmm. And I love you very much. And, Lori, I love you. Bill. Hmm. After all these years, you don't want to trade me in for a later model? Uh, not just yet, dear. But I'm delighted to be stuck with what I've got. For a while, anyway. <laughs> well, thank you, darling. You're still very sweet and so romantic. <laughs> and this is it. Oh, add some of the toast and caviar. Yes, of course. Mm. Oh, it's great. It's wonderful. Happy New Year, darling. Oh, Happy New Year to you. And with luck, to another 30 years to come. Well, at the very least, I'll drink to that. <laughs> to us. <laughs> what is it, Norman? What's wrong? Oh. Norman? What's oh. happening? Oh. What can I get you? Oh. Norman? <coughs> Speak to me. What is it? Oh. Norman? Norman, darling. 
Open your eyes. You're frightening me. Are you all right? Uh, where am I? Oh. Lori. Oh, everything's going to be all right. Now, uh, you started to drink your champagne. You began to choke. Uh, and suddenly you passed out. For long? Five, ten seconds, maybe. You all right now? Yeah, I'm fine. Just fine. I think. Has this happened before, Norman? I, uh, didn't want to worry you. Recently? The last couple of weeks, two or three times. Oh. Once at lunch with a couple of the fellas from the office. Have you been in pain? No, no, not really. Well, you've got to see a doctor. Yeah, I suppose so. Maybe I will. No, no, no maybes, Norman. Tomorrow morning you make an appointment with Forrest Hatton. What, New Year's Day? It's a holiday, even for doctors. Well, then the next day, Tuesday. Yeah. All right, maybe... Maybe it's not a bad idea. I'll call him at home. Norman, you just scared the living daylights out of me. Yeah, I guess I did. Anyway, happy new year, darling. To both of us. Laurie was scared. And I was, too. If you've made up your mind you want to go on living, then you make up your mind to follow the rules. The doctor's rules. Forrest Haddon, who was one of my closest and most trusted friends, put me through the most thorough physical examination I'd ever had in my life. Every test in the book. And then a few days later, at his office... Norman, I've never kidded any of my patients, least of all you. I don't see the point. Uh, when, Forrest? How soon? The operation... Yesterday, Norman. No. The longer we wait, the greater the chance we take. We? Do they suspect of the office? No, no, of course not. And, uh, Lori? Lori. Lori is something else. Oh, what do you say? I am all yours, Dr. Haddon, I guess. I've already called the hospital. They can take you Thursday morning. That's the uh, day after tomorrow. I wouldn't wait, Norman. Okay. Then Thursday morning it is. And uh, the odds of my survival, of my uh, pulling through? Oh, I'm a doctor, Norman, not a gambler. I don't give odds. But if you did? All right, I'd say an even 50-50. No worse? No worse. You'll be at the hospital Thursday morning at 8, admitting room. Um, where are you headed now? The office, then home. I think I'll walk. Clear my head a bit. Do you mind if I walk along with you? <laughs> you were my last patient. No, no, of course not first. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. You're, um... You're afraid I'm about to dissolve into a huge mess of self-pity and despair, aren't you, first? Uh, I might take it into my head to do something rash, right? Could be. And if I did? Oh, that would be very foolish. Well, what would be the sense? None. No, no, Forrest, you're wrong. At this moment, I feel absolutely nothing. Not self-pity. Not despair. Nothing. Just a big... Big emptiness. As if... I were already dead. This afternoon, as I walked along with Forrest Haddon facing the possibility of my own death, it was all very strange. Every deep, passionate feeling I might have had, depression, fear, resentment, anger, was in some curious way drained out of me. There was nothing left inside me except a bloodless, tranquil resignation to a 50-50 chance of the inevitable. Now, there's no point in minimizing the danger, Norman. It's a very tricky, delicate procedure. Oh, I'm not an alarmist. You know that. I know what I'm doing. 
And I'll be working with a team And as we trudged through the snow across from the park toward my office, Forrest kept on assuring me that my life was in the most capable hands. But I couldn't get over the feeling that here I was, living in the very real shadow of death, without my being able to do a thing about it, to control in any way what was happening to me. And what surprised me most was the fact that I was unmoved by the whole thing. And I was cool. Lucky that I, I was calm. Uh, no. Until... Norman, look out! Move it! <laughs> well, what happened? Uh, that big pot with a plant in it must have toppled off the roof of that penthouse. The wind must have blown it. Oh, it's a good thing you saw it coming, Forrest. And pushed me out of the way. Yes, just in time. It missed my head by Could inches. Split your skull right in two. Well, come on, let's not stand here, Norman. Let's move before anything else happens. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you very much. <laughs> For a moment, I'd been brought back to reality. And then a minute later, that same dullness, the feeling of being isolated from the rest of the world, began to take over again. I think that's wonderful about your book, Norman. You know, I don't see how you manage it. A full-time... Forrest kept on talking about my work, possibly to get my mind off whatever was wrong with me. We kept walking through the slush and snow. What kind of scene do you think? And I was oblivious to what was going on. I remember starting to cross the street, and then... Norman! What are you doing? You come back here. The light was against you. The brakes on that fellow's car hadn't held you. You'd have been killed. Yes, I... I suppose so. I, I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking far as my mind uh, uh, on, on other things. Of course, I'm aware of that. But for Pete's sake, Norm, what are you trying to do? Uh, my, uh, my office is in that building over there. I think I'd like to sit in the park alone, if you don't mind, Forrest, before I go up. Oh, sure, Norman. I, I appreciate your company. It was very thoughtful. I'll uh, see you day after tomorrow at the hospital. 8 a.m. Admitting room. Thanks again, Forrest. And whatever you do, you take it easy, please. I sat down on one of the park benches, and I must have dozed off into a kind of dream. I thought I saw myself actually dead, with it, tattered, one eye, pecked out by birds. Through the trees, I saw a vision of the resurrection. A flat plain of writhing graves and rolling tombstones. The rising dead seemed unable to breathe as they struggled upward through the frozen snow out of the earth. After no more than a minute, I came to and started for my office. Now, what was the sense of not quite being connected with what was happening? Was this some weird anticipation or presentiment of my own death to come? The falling flower pot, my walking in front of that automobile, were they triggered by something that was making me withdraw from all reality, all sense, instincts, even of self-preservation? Before that cold and bony hand was laid on mine, I had no way of knowing. A certain soothsayer warned Julius Caesar to be on his guard against a great peril, a peril that could lead to his death. On the day of the month, the Romans called the Ides, the Ides of March. When that day came and Caesar was on his way to the Senate, he passed a soothsayer in the street, and with a smile he said, The Ides of March have come, and nothing terrible has happened to me. The soothsayer answered, Yes, the Ides have come, but they are not yet gone. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. is the veil which those who live call life. They sleep and it is lifted. That was written by one of our great poets. Do those words apply to Norman Hill or are the words of Aesop, the teller of fables, more appropriate? He said, better die once and for all than to live in the continual terror of death. 
On a bitterly cold winter's day, Norman sits alone on a park bench, taking the measure of death. The year was only a few days old. The beginning of things. I wandered slowly out of the park toward my office. The children were romping with their sleds in the fresh snow and the winter sun. Gathering strength and experience for the business of life. And I kept thinking, I have been part of all this. And for all I know, I'm nearly done with it now. I walked through the doors of my office, and a curious thing, no one paid any attention to me. Not a soul even looked up from his desk to greet me. It was as if I weren't there. I couldn't understand it. Had I suddenly become invisible or what? I got to my own little cubicle of an office, and I felt a sharp jab of pain just below the heart. My office was bare, completely bare. The chair and the desk were gone, the carpeting, my books, the pictures on the walls, everything... My, my name plate on the door, even that had been removed. And for the first time since leaving the doctor's office, I lost the feeling I'd had. That feeling of numbness. Now, what's been happening here? Where are my things? Huh? Well, somebody talk to me? Talk to me! Hey, hey, easy. No, I'm take it easy. Relax. Now, Mr. Lewis, what is this? Just look at my office. <laughs> Surprise! Surprise? Now, for Pete's sake, what on earth are you talking about? That... I'm sorry, excuse me, excuse me for shouting. I, I didn't mean to yell. Oh, that's perfectly all right. We may have overdone things a bit. We had no idea you'd take it this way. Take what? What way? <laughs> Your promotion. My what? Oh, my boy, the way you handled our new account, that was absolutely brilliant. No one in the office could have done it the way you did. And so the board and I decided to kick you up to an executive vice presidency. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's wonderful. Wonderful, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Th thank you very much. <laughs> that's why we had, to, had them clear out your old office. Uh, the big one in the corner, over there. That's yours. All new furnishings. Your personal things are already in. Well, you know, for a minute there with nobody in the office even looking well, at that me... that was part of the act. Part of the surprise. Yeah, well, I... I must say you threw a real scare into me. I had the feeling maybe... Maybe I wasn't really here that none of those things was actually happening. Oh, they're happening all right, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll be with us for a very long, long time. Well, that, Mr. Lewis, at the moment is uh, a little questionable. Questionable? Well, I'll, I'll know better on Thursday, Thursday morning. Now, now look, we're, we're ready to match any offer anyone else is making you. Oh, I doubt that you could match this one, Mr. Lewis. Anyway, I wouldn't... Uh, call it an offer. Not exactly. On my way home, I found myself lost again in a shifting maze of thoughts about death. I felt more and more certain that on Thursday morning, I was going to die under the operation. Laurie? You home, dear? It's me. My wife wasn't home. She was shopping, of course. Shopping. At this time, something very odd was going on. The, ch the chairs, the, the sofa were all covered with big white sheets. Every surface of every table had been cleared. The drapes had been taken down. And that dull stab of pain hit me once again in the pit of the stomach. I started for the bedroom to change my clothes. Hello? So glad to find you in at last. Been trying to get you all afternoon. Who is this? Who's calling? About the arrangements. The director wasn't quite clear about one or two of the details. Uh, what? What arrangements? Which details? Who is this? First, he wasn't 
kept altogether certain how many limousines you had ordered. Limousines? The remains will be properly embalmed, of course, as ordered. But was it your desire to have the lid of the casket of the departed left open or closed? Now, would you, for heaven's sake, tell me who this is? Sir, you are not answering my question. Now, before I hang up on you for the last time, who are you? Who is this? The golden rule, funeral services, of course. Serving families, as you know, with dignity and sympathy at all modest costs since 1898. This is the secretary of the director speaking, Mrs. Haven Castle. Funeral services? Why, why are you calling us? Well, isn't this Mr. Yamashita? Mr. Shizuki Yamashita? Or have I by some mischance got a wrong number? Oh, sister, have you got a wrong number? Sorry, terribly sorry. I drifted back into the bedroom. Is that you, dear? Oh, what a surprise. What a big surprise. Laurie, have you been home all this time? Of course, in the other bedroom, trying on a couple of new dresses I bought. I had the door shut. Is that, is that one of the new dresses? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think? And what are you doing home? Uh, at this time of day, that is. Well, uh, it's been a long day. A pretty full day, too. I, uh, I saw... Forrest Haddon this morning. He had the x-rays, lab reports, everything. And? And he, uh, he's operating on me uh, Thursday morning. That soon? Yeah, my, uh, my chances of getting through the operation are no better than 50-50, uh, Forrest says. Lori, at the office, I, uh, I've been promoted. Executive vice, vice president. New office, new everything. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, vice president. Maybe uh, for one whole day. What do you mean by that? Well, I... could be dead day after tomorrow. Norman, dear, worrying about it isn't going to help. Now, both of us, we have to think positively. And feeling sorry for yourself won't help. You know... Uh... A strange phone call as, as I came in. A uh, funeral parlor. What? Yeah, it was the wrong number, they said. Now, Lori, what, what on earth is going on here? Now, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. Norman, you're hurting me. Let go of me, please. What's the matter with you? Why have you got sheets all over the furniture? Why is everything cleaned up and put away? As, as if we or you were, were going on a, on, a, on a long trip someplace. As if I were making arrangements to close down the place. Now, why? But darling, you know as well as I do. The painters are coming in to do the apartment tomorrow morning. Tomorrow? Now, now try to control yourself. I know the strain you've been under. It, it's not been easy for me either. I, I don't know. I don't know. You're... Your whole attitude since I came in like I was speaking to a stranger. The way you look at me. The way you talk. It's all in your mind. As if for some reason you were frightened of me. As though you were looking at a, at a ghost. Somebody who'd come back from the grave. Norman. That dress. That dress you're wearing. What about Well, wouldn't you take it off? That's what a widow wears, isn't it? You're in mourning for me already. Oh, Norman, you can't mean what you're saying. That's a black dress. It's black. Out of respect for the dead. Let me turn on the lights. Now, what color is my dress, Norman? It's, uh... It's blue. It's blue, isn't it? Kind of a, a navy blue. I thought it was black. I'm sorry. It's all right. Lori. Lori, what's wrong with me? Oh, you're upset, Norman. Terribly upset. And you have every reason, every right to be... Oh, look, darling, why don't you lie down for a bit? You know, when Forrest told me about my chances of pulling through, my, my, my body, my mind, everything seemed to go numb, lifeless. As if this were about to happen to somebody else, not to me. And then, and then it suddenly hit me. This is, this is happening to me. And I'm afraid. A, a nap. A nap before dinner will do you a world of good. Put all those dreadful thoughts out of your head. And in the morning... In the morning, nothing will have changed. Nothing. But in the morning, after tossing frantically in my bed all night without even a minute's sleep, I had an idea that I... 
I thought might put my mind at ease. Laurie, let's drive up to Avalon. Avalon? Uh Uh-huh. The cemetery? Yes, exactly. You want to drive to the cemetery in this rainstorm? We'll be drowned. Darling, I'd like to go. I'd, I'd just like to walk around and look at the family gravestones, you know, the, the whole families. I don't know why, but I think it'll make me feel better. Well, if that's what you want, dress warmly. Oh, it'll be freezing up there. And we'll take two umbrellas. Thank you, Lori. In less than an hour, we were at Avalon Cemetery, where my family had been buried for over a hundred years. And we stood there before the big family plot while the wind almost tore our words away and the rain drummed down on our two black umbrellas. Oh, keep your coat buttoned tight around your neck. Yeah, Yeah, that's uh, Grandfather Curtis over there, my mother's father. Christopher Curtis, born 1859, died 1911. That that big headstone over there? Yeah, my my father's father's father, my great-grandfather, Charles Robert Hill, born 1838, died 1863. Only 25. Killed at the Battle of Chickamauga in the Civil War. The lettering on some of these stones is so worn, you you can hardly read it. Uh, This is your father's grave over here, isn't it? And uh, and next to him, your mother. Yes, yes, that's right. And right behind them, over there... No. Oh, no. I I don't believe it. Norman, what is it? Next, next to Grandfather Hills. That's, that's impossible. What are you talking about? The letters are badly worn, but you, you can still see the name. Norman Hill. Laurie, the grave we're looking at is mine. At this moment, it would seem that his fear of death has led Norman Hill to the point where he questions whether or not he is still alive. With Shakespeare's Prince of Denmark, he may be thinking, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long a life. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Hill, under the dark shadow of a fate he sees as fairly certain, death has suddenly become definable, perceptible, real. So much so that he's beginning to doubt whether he is still alive, or perhaps he has fallen into the kind of deep sleep that is death without dying, living but not life. He and his wife, Lori, on a windy, rain-swept morning, stand in a corner of a cemetery looking at the cold, gray headstones over the graves of Norman's family. What you see? Right behind those other gravestones, over there. Oh, no, I don't believe it. Norman, what is it? That, that headstone next to my grandfather's. It, it's impossible. What are you talking about? The letters are badly worn. You can barely make out the name, but look closely. It says, Norman Hill... Lori, the, the grave we're looking at is mine. Norman, be sensible. Now, get closer to it. Look again. I know. It's so hard to see in the rain. Well, look at it. Look at the letters. Look at the dates. Born 1859. That's Grandma Hill. That's my grandmother's grave. Of course. And her name Her was... name was Norma. I was named after her. That's what the headstone reads. An O-R-M-A. The extra N. I thought I read. It just isn't there. Darling, it's cold. Yeah. Wouldn't it be more sensible to go back home now before we both come down with pneumonia? up at dawn. I'd been
been awake and hot and thirsty all night long. The glow of pain under my ribs seemed more massive than ever. We'd better go, Norman. Sure. On a dot of eight, I checked into the admitting room at the hospital. I kissed Lori. Was it goodbye? After what seemed like an eternity of details of preparation, I was finally placed on a table and wheeled into the operating room. Forrest Haddon, in his operating greens, was standing over me. Good morning, Norman. How do you feel? All right, I guess. <laughs> Will it hurt much? No, not a bit. You'll be out cold under a general anesthetic. And your heart's as sound as a bell, so we don't have to worry about that. Oh, that's good. All right now, Norman. Start counting backwards. Begin with the hundred. Backwards. One hundred. Ninety-nine. Ninety-eight. Ninety-seven. It's very good, Norman. Excellent. Ninety-six. Mm-hmm. Ninety-five. Mm-hmm. Ninety-four. Just breathe normally. Ninety-three. It's fine. Ninety-two. Fine. Ninety-one. I knew I'd never come out of the ether. Just as I was going under, I think I heard Forrest say to one of his assistants, We've got to be extra careful. One little slip of the knife into a branch, any branch of the portal vein, and we're out of luck. I could still make out his words. This was my last moment of awareness, my last act of consciousness. 73... 72, 71, and then a great silence, a monstrous silence, an impenetrable blackness came over me. There must have been an interval of absolute unconsciousness, seconds, maybe minutes. And I realized I was not dead. I was still in my body. But all the sensations that make up the background of consciousness had gone. I do not think I saw. I do not think I heard. But I was aware of everything that was going on. Forrest was bending over me. The lower part of his face was masked. Behind his glasses, his eyes were intent, unmoving, glued onto whatever he was doing. Stand by the suction. Scalpel. I saw him reach for the scalpel, a large one. I saw him slice into my flesh with swift dexterity. It was interesting to see myself being cut into as if I were a drum of cheese without the slightest bit of pain. I was looking into Forrest's eyes, into his mind, his brain. I could see that he was being extremely careful, afraid of cutting a branch. Uh, what do you call it? Oh, yes, a branch of the portal vein and ending my life right there and then. I could read his thoughts in his eyes. You're right, Norman. Absolutely right. I'm struggling between the two possibilities of either cutting too little or cutting too much. And I'm afraid. Afraid. And then suddenly, like an escape of water from under a floodgate, I could see a great swirling a brush of horrible realization in far size. Damn. The vein. I've cut into the vein. The brown purple blood gathered in a swift bead trickling over my side. Forrest flung the scalpel aside and began to shout. Ice! Ice! Quick! Ice! Lots of it! And hand me that clamp! Thoughts rushed through my mind with incredible speed, but with perfect clarity. Even though my body still clung to me by the merest thread, I knew that in spite of all his skill, Forrest had killed me. I was aware of a growing pull upon me as though some huge magnet were drawing me out of my body. The doctor, his assistants, the nurses seemed to have vanished. And I was in midair, flying, 
swiftly upward. And the circle of scenery beneath me grew wider and wider. And the sky became deeper and richer in color until in no time at all, it had become a terrifying black. As dark and foreboding as no blackness I had ever beheld before. An innumerable host of stars broke out upon the sky. And then as from nowhere, the sun suddenly appeared, wiping out the darkness. An incredibly strange and wonderful disk of blinding white light rimmed about with a fringe of writhing tongues of red fire. Turn away, Norman. Don't look at it. Protect your eyes. How? How do I do that? Put your hands over your eyes. Uh, just... Just a minute. Who are you? Where are we? I'm here to help you. Why, I can't see you. I have the feeling that I've not left the earth, but that the earth is pulling away, leaving me. It's interesting that you should notice uh, so soon. Well, not only... Not only the earth, but the, the whole solar system seems to be streaming past me. I wonder if scattered in the wake of the earth there must be others like me. Maybe millions and millions of them floating through space. The same as I am. That's altogether possible. But suppose I, I, I should collide into some of them. Oh, that's not very likely. Why not? The space through which you're all traveling, you and they, is infinite. It has no beginning. It has no end. Plenty of room for all of you. Look, look, the North Star. Over there, the Little Dipper. Isn't that the Southern Cross? It's so clear, so big. You know your stars. What you, what you see in my latest book, Lost in the Stars, I, I, I called it. Yes? Oh, I, I shouldn't be talking about my book, not now. Oh, my. Such color. As though the light... We're coming from a world of sapphires and and that oh that big red one down there like a brilliant ruby rushing up to us. That's Mars, and uh, that one is Venus. Oh yes, and, and uh, the one with the little moons around it and all those rings. Saturn, of course. Oh yes, and those rings are all crystals of ice. Now with luck we get to the interesting part. Oh, and what's that? Outside and beyond your solar system, past all the planets you know. With luck. What does that mean? Where... Where are we? Where have we come to? To the edge of the outer universe. It was hard to believe what I was saying. Faster and faster, one galaxy after another rushed by. A hurry of whirling fireballs speeding into the endless void of space. Countless... Unfamiliar planets and constellations circled about me, catching the light in some ghostly fashion, and then vanished into non-existence. I had at last reached the complete wilderness of space. And now, at last, I knew what happens when you leave this earthly life. The long, long sleep. Now I knew what it felt like to be dead. Suddenly I was no longer a detached observer. I was terrified, thrown into an intolerable darkness, horror and despair. Because I knew now, I knew now I didn't want to leave the earth so soon. I knew now I wanted to live. And again... I heard that same voice. Norman, you see that little speck of light? Yes. Keep your eye on it. It's growing bigger. It's more distinct, like... like a pale brown cloud of some kind. That's funny. Funny? The, the shape of it, I, I think... I think I've seen something like it somewhere before. It's, it's like, uh... Yes? Like a clenched fist. Do you see anything else? Yes, the, the fist, the, ha the hand, is holding a, a stick. A shiny white stick of some kind. But not, nothing, nothing is very clear. Nothing is in focus. And above the hand, there's a little circle of, of light, sort of phosphorescent. Uh, the, the stick and the hand are just below it. You'll be all right, Norman. 
everything's going to be all right. All right. And there will be no pain, Norman. No pain ever again. Why? How? You Why? may live to be 115, Norman, and able to eat and drink almost anything. The operation, I'm happy to say, has been 100% successful. I was in a hospital bed. The circle of light I'd been looking at was the face of a clock on the wall. And the white rod was the railing at the foot of the bed. Norman. Norman, darling. Oh, thank heavens it's all over. Lori. Lori, I'm alive. Of course you're alive. How do you feel? I'm not sure. A little weak. You see, I've been away for a while. Far away. On a rather long trip. I know, dear. I know just what you mean. You know what? I have a wonderful idea for my next book. Oh, you mustn't talk. You must rest. It's about this fella whose doctor starts to operate on him. A 50-50 chance of his making it. The doctor's knife slips. The patient sees the accident, realizes he's dead. Goes off on a journey into space. Sees all kinds of strange phenomena. If a writer of science fiction envisions his passage to eternity as an eerie odyssey through space, how do you suppose another person would see it? A coal miner, for example. Would he perhaps find himself digging down, down, down forever until he reaches ink-black oblivion? Or a carpenter? Would he be building an unending stairway of steps and risers leading to... A perpetual, everlasting nothingness. We'll never know. I'll be back shortly. In recent days, there have been many heated discussions over the true definition of the word death. Biological death? Where there is total and permanent cessation of all vital functions. Legal death, where many of these vital functions continue, but where there are no other signs of life as we know it. We leave the resolution of this question to the theologians, the scientists, even the lawyers. One thing we're almost sure of, along with Norman Hill. The journey to death may not only be terrifying... But it will also be very interesting. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Ann Williams, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. The spirit, having achieved the ultimate understanding, leaves the body and tries to become one with the universe. Leonard, I'm drowning. But the time is not yet, and so it must be born anew in another body. Leonard, is this you? Bridges, I am finally free. I know at last. I know. The guru showed me who I am. Who are you? I have been born again. Recreated, although uh, realistically I never died. Yeah? Once again I walk the world, I think, I dream, I create. But who are you? That is, who do you think you are? Oh, I know who I am. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Leonardo da Vinci. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.